Hello everyone, my name is Zahid Jaffrey, and welcome to the third annual From Abraham, Three Faiths event, organized by Mosaic Interfaith and the Organization for Islamic Learning. Mosaic Interfaith was founded over 30 years ago to foster interfaith dialogue in the community. The co-chairs of Mosaic Interfaith, who I'm sure are no strangers to many of you, are Ghulam Sajjan and Fran Isaacs, and they've been running these programs for decades. The Organization for Islamic Learning was founded 15 years ago with the basic objective of promoting religious dialogue. The objective of the seminar today is to promote dialogue and open lines of communication for all persuasions. The topic is, is religion killing us? Together we aim to address the growing grassroots concerns about the perceived connections between violence and religion. Since interfaith activities are key elements of the Abrahamic faiths and extended beyond, and with the participation I see here today, I, for one, am overwhelmed and really looking forward to the afternoon seminar. Hopefully, we will all be educated in the process and better appreciate the universality and what it takes to live in this global village. Today, making a better world for the generations to come. Looking around the audience here, it is obvious we have come from different parts of the world. So we want to make sure we have people from different walks of life sitting at each table. Because I am sure each one of you has something to share. Now, this weekend marks the day we honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Actually, tomorrow. Now, everybody here knows Dr. King, but just a quick recap. He was a very devout Christian, a reverend, uh, who fought for civil rights for his people. And he did it through nonviolence. So obviously you can see the parallels to this, what we're doing today and the, the theme of Dr. King. So on that note, and with that esteem, I'd like to invite Dr. Uh, not Dr. But Jagmohan, he might be a doctor. <laughs> Jagmohan Singh to give us a small presentation honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and it's uh, an honor to be here. And I've been associated with uh, the Mosaic Institute for about four years now, but uh, I have only spoken about uh, my religion, the Sikh religion, and it's the first time I'm talking about Dr. Martin Luther King. And it has happened that about <laughs> a week ago, Fran sent me an email that uh, before we do the panel uh, on the is religion killing us, can you do a five minutes presentation on Dr. Martin Luther King? And, Julia, and I was surprised because uh, there are two things I was surprised about. One was that they want five minutes, then five minutes to talk about Dr. King, and his achievements are beyond what we know, in fact. That's what I'm going to try to tell today. Another thing is that I'm not an expert on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So, but still I accepted the invitation, I'll try to do my best. And so I made a PowerPoint presentation so that we can all understand. So uh, the topic of the presentation, a man is not made for that, is from one of the sermons that Dr. King gave in 1955, I guess. And so uh, we'll get to that point uh, later. But first of all, as I said, uh, we'll talk about his achievements. So Dr. King, as we know, tomorrow is the Dr. Martin Luther King Day celebrated in the U.S. And, but his contribution to nonviolence and civil, and civil rights is not only for America or North America, it's beyond that. So he, he came into light, limelight because of many reasons, but I put a few of them. So first one was the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. That's when Rosa Parks refused to get up or leave a seat for a white person, and that was the end of the segregation in the end. So he led the agitation for about 382 days when the people of color, I would like to call them, because I'm also one of them, were refused to sit uh, uh, in, the, in the bus, and, and so they, they refused to take the bus unless they were, allowed, they were allowed to sit down. And then he assumed the leadership of, in fact, he founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1957 and was 
it's a president or leader for a long, long time. And then the, I think the, the most uh, uh, profound or astounding event that happened was in 1963 is a march on Washington where he give, gave his famous speech, which I think is believed to be one of the uh, most articulate ways of uh, speaking anywhere. I have a dream, and I, I, I know you guys know more about that speech than I do, so I'm not going to talk about that. that. And then another event that shaped the history, uh, and it was driven by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., was his opposition to Vietnam War in 1965. Then he led the people, poor people's campaign in 1968. And during all this time, from 1950s to 1968, when he uh, passed away or he was uh, killed by a bullet, he traveled over. He traveled over six million miles, and uh, he was arrested 29 times. He spoke at about 2,500 events and. He led many, many agitations, and uh, so, uh, so th th that was a major event. And then there are some of the other achievements, major achievements. He had many achievements, and so some of the major ones, only three are listed here. Are the, one is Civil Rights Act 1964, so it, it, that offered equality to uh, people of dark or black colored skin and others and the Voting Rights Act 1965, and then he won a Nobel Peace Prize for combating, combating racial inequality through nonviolence. So these three, these three achievements, there are many more, were that changed the whole world. So that's why if we try to confine Dr. King to USA or to North America, it's probably not wise. Because if you can imagine if, uh, if those things were still happening today or even for many, many years uh, since then, then the, our world would have been different. It, 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 like he, he changed, he had a big impact on the world. And all he did, all that he achieved was uh, through nonviolence. And I, I have two quotes here. Uh, like uh, one of them is that the method of nonviolent resistance is most potent weapon available. So in very to the oppressed people in the struggle for justice and humanity. So very early in his life, like he was a very young person, and he, very early in his life he realized that the one way to fight for any injustice is through non-violence. Violence doesn't help. And why it doesn't help? Because hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And he was a strong believer in that. And then, but he also realized that that freedom is not given to you freely. Like you can't sit at home and expect that it's your right and it will be all, come to you on a, on a plate, so on a platter. So he said, if we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor, it must be demanded by the oppressor. So you have to fight for your rights. But the, the right way to fight for your rights is non-violence, not get into violence. And Human rights. So, as I said before, like his contribution to human rights is probably far greater than anybody else in the world. And because he fought against injustice, and he believed that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So you can't have say that if something is happening wrong in a, another part of the world, it doesn't affect us. We are sitting home here talking about something, and we can like ignore it. But no, that's not possible. And then, then the one quote from his speech, that I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of the skin, but by the content of their character. So he, he fought for the equal rights of uh, all the people, and not only for his people, if you want to call them. And then it, another quote is, the freedom is one thing, you have it all or you are not free. So you can't say that, okay, I'm okay, I, I can work around it, or I can live with what I have, but uh, not have the full freedom, whether it's freedom for uh, people or for women or for anybody. So those were uh, two major areas of his work during his life, and the topic that I chose for today's presentation, man is not made for that, is from one of his sermons, and I took a quote, I think I'm going to read it because this is uh, probably one of the best quotes I have ever read. 
He said, man is not made to dwell, dwell in the valleys of sin and evil. Man is made for that which is high and noble. When I see how we fight vicious wars and destroy human life on bloody battlefields, I find myself saying, man is not made of that. So is that, and that also relates to a topic today, is religion killing us? The, the relationship between religion and violence that's happening all around the world. And he continued, when I see how we live our lives in selfishness and hate, again I say, man is not made for that. When I see how we often throw away the precious life that God has given us in righteous living, again, I find myself saying, man is not made for that. So what is man made for? My friends, man is made for the stars, created for eternity, born for the everlasting. Man is a child of the Almighty God, born for his everlasting fellowship. That's what man is made for, not for injustices or doing injustices or bearing them or for violence or for any type of stuff that's going on. My time is up. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Singh. That was very brilliant. Um, before I continue, I was just given um, a, a, a shout out of an interfaith event that's taking place on February 7th. It's the World Interfaith Harmony Week. Um, if you guys are interested at all, it's taking place at the Japanese Canadian Cultural Center. And it's very much the same interfaith esteem that we are having this event today. So if you're interested at all, come see me and I'll tell you where you can get more details on that. So. On that note, I'd like to introduce our panelists for this afternoon. Um, each of our panelists are highly esteemed. Now let's just quickly go through their bios, if you have a moment, which I know you do. Uh, Reverend Canon John Hill is a Christian priest of the Anglican Church and a canon of the Cathedral of St. James, Toronto. Until recently, he served as the interfaith officer of the Anglican Diocese of Toronto. For some, for some years, he has written and lectured on mimetic theory and the phenomenon of sacred violence. His presentation today will be on mimetic theory. I was going to say he's on your far right, but he's actually right here. And, um, yeah, so you will see him shortly. Uh, rabbi Emeritus Michael Stroh, seated on your far left, is, has been the rabbi of Temple Har Zion since 1971. So that's 42 years, like longer than I've been alive. And... He teaches regularly at Kalal, the Center for Liberal Jewish Learning. He's been an instructor at Queens College, the Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, the University of Waterloo, and a past member of the theology faculty at, the, at St. Michael's College, University of Toronto. Rabbi Stroh is a past president of Arzo Canada, the Reformed Zionist Organization, and a past chairperson of Arzo New, International Federation of Reform and Progressive Religious Zionists. His presentation today will be on Richard Rubenstein's theory of sacrifice and the Holocaust. Dr. Lincoln Fakim is the Sergeant Chair in Global Islam at Master University. A native of Zanzibar, Tanzania, he has spoken at more than 80 academic conferences and authored 100 scholarly works. He teaches a wide range of courses on Islam and offers a course on comparative religions. Professor Fakim's most recent book is titled Shiism in America and was published in the summer of 2009. His debut book was The Heirs of the Prophet, Charisma and Religious Authority in Shia Islam, and it was published in 2006. His recent work uh, that he's working on is Ijtihad and Reformation in Islam. His presentation will be on Messianic Enthusiasms. All three of these panelists have done a ton of other stuff that I just can get into right now. But this is the Clip Stones version. So please join me in welcoming welcome them here today. On that note, I'd like to introduce Reverend John Hill. Thank you. Thank you. I will try to uh, speak without a microphone, uh, but if you can't hear me, put up your hand. I'll stop shouting. If you cannot read the screen, you will have, you will have to move in order to uh, get this, this presentation because it's uh, almost totally communicated on screen. 
Do we need to? Okay. Oh, fine, it's fine here. You're okay there. Uh, I, and when the three of us sat down to figure out how on earth we were going to address this difficult question that you, I don't know who put it, but some of you who raised this question about violence and religion. And my suggestion was that uh, mimetic theory is one of the most powerful ways of getting underneath this, this question. Uh, I will not be able to present mimetic theory today, only just a sl tiny slice of it. Enough, however, hopefully to whet your imagination and make you curious about how this uh, explanation of violence might work. But the first thing I'm going to do is invite you in silence to think about the kind of phenomenon that, that you associate with the eruption of violence. And I'm going to put some words up on the screen, and you may not agree with all of the connections, but see how many of them ring a bell with you. So I want to talk to you about uh, a small part of mimetic theory, and the first part is about individual personal relations, although uh, I've put up on, the, on the, the screen a different word, which is uh, a word that's characteristic of uh, practitioners of this theory, interdividual, which suggests that there really is no such thing as an individual. We are all of us interdividuals. Our lives are formed by our relationships. Now, mimetic theory is about miming or imitating, although it's a particular kind of imitation that we have in mind here. It's the kind of largely unconscious imitation that happens. Um, here's just a very simple example of um, desire uh, that results from imitation. Now, when I use the word desire, I'm not thinking of, you know, bodily instincts or, or, or needs. I'm talking about the desires that we didn't always have, but have somehow developed. And we like to think that they came from us. I need a, an iPhone because, well, I, it's just so, it would be so useful. It would help me with so many tasks that... I otherwise can't do quite as, as well. At least that's what I tell myself. Sorry. I need to go back. Uh, the reality of uh, desire, oops, 
more <laughs> the reality of desire looks more like this that is to say I didn't know I wanted an iPhone as badly as I do until I noticed that you had one um, why is this well it, this is, in fact, the, the fundamental formative uh, factor in all of our lives from the moment we're born. A, a child born into the world has no sense of him or herself, uh, has no uh, way of communicating, except by learning to imitate. And the desire to imitate is really the desire to begin to have a being. Now, by the time I'm an adult, I am inclined to think that I have a being, and I know who I am, and I don't need to imitate anybody, but the truth is, I'm always struggling with this big hole in me, this existential vacuum of wondering who I really am until I see somebody whom I would like to be, and then I know who I am, and I want to have what that person has. So this is the basic nature of mimetic desire. Down the street from me on Young Street is this building which, whose facade just about says it all. The brand factory is in the business of inventing desire. That's how it works. Or, if you can read this cartoon, you see how it works for a child. This is how advertising works. Um, growing up, especially as a teenager, I remember all the anxiety I suffered about whether I was uh, a real man. How do you know what a real man looks like? Well, the Marlboro uh, advertisement tells you what a real man looks like. So all I need to do is learn to smoke, especially Marlboros. What is a real woman like? Well, advertising will tell you that, and this is an interesting advertisement, I don't know what it's for, but um, you can see that, uh, that uh, she is desirable because she's considered desirable by a whole host of men who are not individually attracted to her, except for the first guy. All the rest are falling over one another to imitate the first one. Now, as I said, a child uh, grows into a human life by imitating uh, the models who are its uh, parents. And this is a very good thing. And in fact, uh, parents are normally not uh, threatened by uh, their children's imitation. They're really delighted by it. Uh, and that's really because th there's no way a, a child is ever going to take the place of one of those parents, unless you believe in Freud. Um, yeah. But if that distance, that social distance between the, the subject and the model starts to decrease, um, the nature of the relationship between the subject and the model begins to change too. And if, the, if it collapses to near zero, the, the social distance, then the model begins to come, become an obstacle. The model says, uh, I will be flattered if you like to have what I have, but you can't have it because it's mine, right? I found myself once following a shiny black Lexus, uh, and, and then I looked at the license plate. Would someone like to read that out loud? Oh, sorry, did it again. I am the one to envy. Which means I will be flattered if you would like to have my car, but you can't have it because it's mine. So subject and model become rivals in that way. It's often pointed out that in a room full of toys, two children who are playing in the room will sooner or later end up fighting over the same toy. Why? Well, be because as soon as the person playing with the toy in the first place sees it's desirable by the, another child, then it becomes more desirable to himself in the first place and that makes it even more desirable to the one who envies it, and so it goes. 
and rivals end up becoming mirror images of one another, actually forgetting the object of desire itself. Even if they're adults. Maybe more if they're adults. For example, I'm driving around a huge shopping mall parking lot looking for a parking space and everything is jammed up. And then over there I see uh, an empty space and I start heading for it. And then over the corner of my eye I see that you're heading for the same parking space and the one thing that becomes more important to me at that moment than getting to that parking space is beating you to it. So let's talk about mimetic theory in terms of social relations. You remember that rivals become mirror images of one another, and thus they become, uh, yeah, they become rivals. And in any social group, whenever a crisis creates insecurity, then rivalry and resentment quickly turn into a situation of all against all a kind of growing plague of violence. Uh, we see that in all sorts of groups, nations, uh, clans, families, religious groups, until one person switches his resentment to focus on an outsider, a scapegoat, and others begin to imitate that person, and finally everyone follows suit and the victim is lynched in some fashion. Maybe they are blacks or Jews or a distant tribal society. They know what happened. And thus all resentments, hostilities, and grudges are offloaded onto the scapegoat and social cohesion and stability is restored even if we're merely becoming mirror images of the original offenders who triggered the social crisis. Now, needless to say, social cohesion and stability are good and desirable ends for which we thank God. But if social stability has become an idol, demanding sacrifice, as all idols do sooner or later, it will always be seeking new scapegoats to restore social cohesion and stability. Which may in fact be the origin of ritual sacrifice. Idols are sacred by definition, which means that they have to be defended at any cost. Well, it's this necessity to defend what is sacred at any cost which mandates the use of good violence to quell bad violence. Which is how a religion, any religion, even a secular religion, ends up violent. So here's the question. How can you tell when God is just a personification of the mind or passions of the crowd? Or to put it another way, how can you tell the difference between God and an idol? Which is another way of asking what kind of God must be defended at any cost? Thank you very much. Mm. Oh. 
are the best um, father in law was talking about smoking ads when we were teenagers. The best anti smoking ad I ever saw was a picture of a coffin, and under it it said, Flip top box for the Marlboro Man. <laughs> Well, all right, I just slide it up. A couple of days ago, my wife Celia and I were riding in I just lost my presentation. What is wrong with development this is? Yeah. Um, a couple of days ago, my wife Celia and I were riding in the car with our four-year-old granddaughter. And she was telling us about a video that she had seen in school. And she said, and there were some colored guys in it. So Celia and I looked at each other because we had not heard anyone use that phrase in a very long time. So I said to her, what color were they? And she said, oh, one was pink, one was green, <laughs> which uh, brought home to me um, the fact that things can change for the better. And that's why we're here. If, when she said it, and do nothing about how it had been spoken in the past, I recognized that things had really changed. Now, I'm going to talk about Richard Rubenstein. Um, Richard Rubenstein is a devout Freudian. He is. Okay? And he draws a lot on Freud. The books he draws on uh, are Totem and Taboo, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, and Civilization and Its Discontents. And what he is dealing with is eros and aggression, primarily aggression. By the way, if I use any terms or say anything you don't understand, I would appreciate it if you would keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There are many vehicles for the channeling of aggression. One of them is sports. Another is religion. The desire to kill God and be free of morality and return to a world of infantile gratification is part of what we are, according to Freud and according to Richard Rubenstein. Civilization depends on suppressing aggression. According to Freud, and according to Richard Rubenstein. In other words, in order uh, for people to live together, there have to be mechanisms for suppressing the aggression that is in all of us. Uh, and it won't go away. And if we do not find a way to, to suppress the aggression, it's going to play itself out, and therefore civilization, by its very nature, is repressive, and we have a desire to return to the infantile world of no repression, which means no morality, and the satisfaction of all of our desires immediately. Now, Richard Rubenstein believes that human nature 
will not go away. I think that one of the differences um, between René Girard and Richard Rubinstein is I think that Girard believes this can be overcome. Richard Rubinstein believes that it cannot, that it is part of human nature and will not go away, and therefore we have to have mechanisms to channel the, this aggression. So now I'm going to talk about Richard Rubinstein and the Holocaust and the way he sees it. First, our rationalist culture since the Enlightenment removes ways to channel aggression that society had, to a great extent in religion, which our rationalism since the Enlightenment believes is superstition and does away with it. As time goes on, we begin to take away more and more of the vehicles that exist in society for releasing aggression. For example, bullfights. I think that even Spain uh, has decided there will be no more bullfights. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, although bullfights, obviously, are a way of channeling aggression in which the bull is the sacrifice, unless the bull wins, in which case the matador is the sacrifice. They both work. Boxing, in which we sit and watch two people try to beat, to, to, to beat the living daylights out of each other. And um, that is regarded in our sophisticated liberal culture um, as uh, terrible to enjoy watching two people um, try to beat the daylights out of each other. Uh, I actually called the newspapers uh, before coming here and said as part of our presentation, the three of us were going to act out the medic theory <laughs> by coming to the center and trying to beat the living daylights out of each other. They were very anxious to cover it. <laughs> when I told them oh, that was just a joke, we're actually going to talk about peace and harmony, they lost interest. <laughs> All right. Um, playing with guns has become reprehensible. Many parents will not permit their children to have toys, or to have guns as toys. Usually they find them anyway from friends, using a stick, using their fingers, all right? This is a way of channeling aggression that people want to remove from us. You can't smoke. You can't even say anything insulting or offensive because you will be pulled up before the Human Rights Commission. As a result of which, through Richard Rubenstein's eyes, when he wrote this, he didn't know a time would come when people couldn't smoke. All right? But that's another step in the taking away. Now, for example, there's now a rule you cannot smoke in prisons. Prisoners cannot smoke. Is this going to increase the aggression of prisoners or not? All right. So, aggression does not go away. History has had a number of religious ways to deal with this. One was sacrificing human beings, and then animals were substituted for that, and the sacrifice of animals became the religious devotional act for many ancient religions, including Judaism. Well, the Bible is filled with animal sacrifice. Of course, none of us does it anymore. The most liberal branch of Judaism, Reform, which is the one that I'm part of, has removed it from the prayer book as something we have no desire to go back to. Conservative Judaism and Orthodoxy have it in there because, because they don't change prayer books now. Um, that easily, but for the most part, certainly conservative and even orthodoxy has no desire 
Um, I'm over time, aren't I? Give me just a couple of more minutes. I'm sorry. Don't count the jokes into my time. <laughs> um, because that's something we simply don't want to go back to. So there's a necessity for a scapegoat. When I was young, we had a pressure cooker. I don't know if any of you is old enough to remember pressure cookers. It cooks by putting a top on it, and the pressure builds up, builds up, and builds up, okay? And once it exploded, and we had vegetables all over the <laughs> ceiling, all right? For Richard Rubenstein, we have created a society that is a pressure cooker because we have no way to let it out. We're too rational. And therefore, the desire, the aggressive desire, has no way to be channeled, and it needs a scapegoat. And the pressure builds up and builds up and builds up until it explodes. And that's the Holocaust. He sees the Holocaust as a grand religious ritual in which the Jews are the sacrifice. All right? In other words, the need for a scapegoat in our society with no ways to channel aggression becomes worse, sorry, becomes worse than the sacrifice of animals. He would go back, he would go back to the sacrifice of animals, all right, because he thinks it did it. Now here we are. Can we overcome the need for a scapegoat? Or is it necessary for us to invent some kind of scapegoat to channel our aggression that will be the least harmful kind of scapegoat we can think of? Thank you. You all know what it means when a professor takes off his watch before he starts speaking, right? <laughs> and he's a rabbi. He's a... It means absolutely nothing, actually. Absolutely nothing. As a rabbi was talking about um, him running over time, I was reminded of this uh, Muslim joke whereby one Muslim is asking another Muslim outside the mosque on a Friday afternoon when the Imam is speaking inside. So one Muslim, Muslim asks the other, is the khutbah, is, is the sermon over inside? And the other one replies, the sermon is over, but the imam is still speaking. <laughs> <laughs> it's very subtle. Anyway, uh, I don't use PowerPoint because in my view, they are PowerPoint less many times. That is the point. Anyway, human beings strive to attain the ideal in the real world. At the first level, this is often translated into creating the perfect man. Uh, the Arabic is called Insani Kamil, seen especially in the Islamic mystical traditions. However, at the social level, the desire to create the ideal is often translated into looking for a divinely inspired figure to establish the ideal kingdom of God on earth. Why do they want to have this ideal? In some ways, the, the idea of waiting for the ideal the Messiah, so to speak, helps one to deal with the injustices that one is going through. So, well, if we wait for him, it's a good, uh, rewarding act to wait, and hopefully he will come soon and liberate us from the injustices. In many ways, we see this uh, in the Essenes also, I believe, uh, just before the coming of Jesus, where the Essenes, they moved away from Jerusalem, went to uh, the Dead Sea, near the Dead Sea, um, hence the Dead Sea Scrolls, waiting for the appearance of the, the Messiah. Others want to be more proactive to create or to pave the way for the coming of the Messiah. Religious language, I think that we have uh, just learned, often lends itself to the language of violence. People claiming to be the soldiers of God, paving the way for the Messiah and defending not only believing in the sacred, but as the Reverend said, defending the sacred through good violence. A good model in our own time um, would be the Iranian Revolution, whereby in the eyes of many at least, 
Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini was paving the way for the coming of what uh, Muslims believe, uh, we'll talk about this a bit more later on, the Mahdi, the rightly guided one, that is the Messiah. Indeed, uh, I was in Iran soon after the revolution, I was studying there, and you will not believe the number of people who kept telling me that Khomeini speaks to the Messiah. Well, that's very dangerous, by the way. Because if Khomeini is, is communicating with the Messiah, that means that his word is often the Messiah's word. And therefore, Khomeini can do no wrong, at least in, that, in their views. Uh, well, uh, historically, he did wrong because he was human. So paving the way is often done in very violent ways. The term Messiah, for our information, comes from the Aramaic Messiha or Mashiha, the anointed one, smeared with oil. And it's important to realize also that the ideas or the idea of the Messiah often evolves through time. It's never static. Of the identity of the Messiah, of what will happen when he will come about, what exactly he will do. And you will see them in almost every religious tradition, whether it's Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. All these three religions have a concept of the Messiah, uh, how he will go about establishing that ideal also changes with time. But the important notion here is that God intervenes in history. He's not a passive God. He intervenes to reverse history and to overcome evil sometimes by creating evil too. Messianic beliefs developed through time, and initially, at least in Christianity and Islam, I'm not sure about Judaism, I think it may be the same. Initially, the idea was that the Messiah will appear soon, in the near future. The early apostles believed that Jesus would come back. Certainly, in the Islamic case, Muslims believed that the Mahdi would come back very soon. Uh, for our information, um, Muslims or Shia Muslims especially used to collect, they still do collect, khums money, or khums, that is um, religious taxes. And you know what they used to do in those days, in the early period, they did not give it to an ayatollah, there was no ayatollah in those days. They would put the money in the ground, believing that the Messiah will come back soon and he can then use that money. Until later on, about 300 years later, he's not coming back in the near future, we might as well use it for the community. It kind of makes sense. So, with time, then, the idea of the Messiah becomes eschatological, that is, end of time appearance. In Judaism, the term the Messiah was often applied to a future king, one who will restore the kingdom of Israel and, importantly, liberate people from foreign rule. And when you're talking of liberation, you're also talking of violence. The ideal, that is the uh, Messianic ideal, is attained through violence. This is a recurrent theme in um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In Judaism, we find that there were different messianic doctrines at different times, often reflecting the mentality and preoccupation of different circles. After 70 CE, for those who are not aware, uh, that 70 CE is significant because that was when the temple was destroyed for the second time. Uh, we have ideas of the returning from exile and rebuilding of the temple through the Messiah. It's also important to know that the Messiah is always an agent of God. In other words, God is active uh, in human history, but in Judaism at least, he's not a savior in the uh, Christian sense. In the rabbinic thought, the Messiah is a king who will redeem and rule Israel at the climax of history. He will, in short, establish the kingdom of God. And as I said, there were different ideas. Um, the Senate expe um, expectations were later more clearly spelled out. He was supposed to be a prophet and not only a prophet, a warrior. In other words, the two terms, whether it is in Islam, Judaism, or Christianity, go hand in hand. He's a prophet or a messianic figure, divinely appointed, but he also has to be a warrior. And you know what that means too. He has to be violent. Not all uh, Jews accepted the idea of the Messiah. For example, if I, and Rabbi will correct me if I'm wrong, Hillel, we, uh, we don't accept it. In the book it's, of Revelation... It's a, it's a different Hillel. It's, it's a different Hillel. It's a different Hillel than the one we all talk about. There you go. Thank you. Uh, the book of Revelation, uh, 
describes end of time events that will occur during the day of the Lord, so to speak. And I, I have, there's a long list, I will not go through all of them. But very briefly, uh, the rise of the Antichrist, by the way, the Antichrist in Islamic tradition is the Dajjal, uh, as a world dictator, terrible judgments by God on the supporters of the Antichrist, the second coming of Jesus, the battle of Armageddon, final punishment of Satan, uh, the destruction of the all heavens and earth, unbelievers will be cast into everlasting fire, and God creates a new heaven and earth. Interestingly, even within Christianity, what happens when the Messiah appears? He will shed blood in the name of God. At least in some uh, uh, tradition, not in all. He will convert and slaughter the Jews. As I said, not all Christians are agreed on uh, this, nor are they agreed on the sequence of events. And it is here that we get the idea of the millennium, by the way, uh, from the Latin thousand, taken from a passage in the book of Revelation. The ideal society whereby there's peace, freedom, and uh, um, rule of the righteous is realized through the Messiah. The entire race, according to this understanding at least, is converted to Christianity, including, of course, the Jews. A millennium of peace and righteousness follows. Let's turn to the Islamic tradition. We'll see all this in this tradition that there is a lot of violence when the Messiah comes in, in one form or another. In the Islamic tradition, the Messiah is called the Mahdi. The term Mahdi, by the way, means one who is rightly guided. Rightly guided by who? By God. Interestingly, um, the term uh, Mahdi does not occur in the Quran at all. Uh, and certainly even in Judaism, we know that the, in the Old Testament, in the earlier periods at least, the idea of the Messiah was more restricted, or it is different from later. It evolved with time. In any case, even in the Islamic tradition, the Messiah is not only the Mahdi, is also the Qa'im. And Qa'im, by the way, means one who stands up, literally. One who rises. What does he rise against? Rises against the forces of evil. And when he rises, there's obviously going to be violence. So, he is a restorer of faith. But not only does he appear and rise, he also brings in a new order. And he does this by destroying the forces fighting, uh, rather in the fight against the forces of evil. Although the purpose of the Messiah in Islam is not war, it is the eradication of war, but he does this through war. Now, by the way, in Iran, at least some scholars are reinterpreting the whole idea of the Messiah. That yes, he will appear, but he will convert through dialogue, not through war. Uh, because Islam cannot be imposed through war. But this is a, a more recent uh, reinterpretation of the earlier tradition. So, through the Mahdi or the Messiah, we see a transition from the history of struggle, suffering and affliction to a future of <coughs> spiritual and physical bliss, uh, to use a distinctly um, Jewish term, where the lion will lay down with the lamb, so to speak. Also, salvation is tied to the idea of the Messiah. That if you do not believe in him, you cannot possibly be saved, at least in the Islamic tradition. Again, you find the identity is not clear, and the idea evolves through time. My time is also uh, running out. Um, within the Islamic tradition, there's two concepts of the Messiah. One is the Shia tradition, one is the Sunni tradition. Interestingly, there have been more figures claiming to be the Mahdi in the Sunni tradition than in the Shia tradition. Simply because in the Sunni tradition, is someone who is out there, he will come later on, we don't really know. Therefore, the Sunnis will never, ever uh, pray for the Messiah to come. You'll never find in the Sunni Muslims say, oh God, please hasten the appearance of the Mahdi. Never. But you'll find this in Shia Islam, because in Shia Islam he's already born. They, they are merely waiting for him to come. So whereas the doctrine of messianism is there in Sunni Islam, it's not central. Because it's not central, it's a vague figure. We've had many, many figures through history who have appeared uh, claiming to be the Mahdi. One of them was um, in Khartoum, if you've seen the movie Jabal Gordon, Gordon of Khartoum, whereby a person claiming to be the Mahdi actually rises and kills the British Viceroy uh, in Khartoum. Uh, another one was um, Juhayman, in 1979, where they were uh, in the uh, Grand Mosque in Mecca, which was taken over. Do you remember that? Yeah, I was there. Actually, I just missed it by a week. <laughs> Luckily, 
Uh, but Juhayman claimed to be the Mahdi and wanted to overthrow the Saudi regime. So many people have claimed to be the Mahdi, and that is uh, accompanied with uprising and shedding of blood. Finally, Jesus in Islamic eschatology is an important figure, but he is not the Mahdi, he is not the Messiah. So actually Muslims are waiting for two figures, not one, the Messiah, the Mahdi, and Jesus. In the Islamic tradition, again, there's a lot of vagueness in this. Jesus will descend in the Holy Land. He will go to Jerusalem. Interestingly, in the Islamic tradition, he will break the cross, not uphold it, to show that he was not crucified. Uh, not only will he go to Jerusalem, he will join forces with the Mahdi, although he will be secondary to the Mahdi. So the Messiah is given a more prominent figure, or more prominence in Islam, than Jesus is. He, that is Jesus, will establish the rule of justice and the coming of Jesus will herald the Qiyamah, that is the hour, the end of time. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our three panelists for three incredibly informative presentations. And now I'd like to turn to you. You guys are all been divided into tables. And for the next few minutes, I want you guys to just discuss what you've talk, what, what you heard and share your perspectives, ask questions, just uh, basically talk about the, the, the last uh, 45 minutes. Um, what I want you to do, what Oil and Mosaic Interfaith would like you to do, is to form one question. One question that you'd like to ask the panelists, and we'll come to each of you table by table, and feel free to ask that question, which the panelists will take turn by turn. Um, is there anything I'm missing? Would you guys like to add anything? 